Historians of Reddit, what's a devastating event that no one talks about? Arctic Redneck 10 said. During World War II the Japanese has invaded the Alaskan island of Attu on the island was the village of Attu where the Aleutian tribe have lived for centuries. The only non-natives were the school teacher and priest husband and wife who were elderly and beloved by the townspeople. They were both shot by the Japanese. After that the Japanese loaded the native population onto ships back to Japan where they worked in POW camps where many died from disease and execution. When the war ended only a handful of the native population survived and they went back home only to find their village burned down. They left the island and it now remains uninhabited basically driving the Atta tribe to extinction. Trenton Tallywicker said, This is fairly recent, started in 1998 and ended in 2003 but the Second Congo War. It's the deadliest conflict since World War II with about 5.4 million deaths a vast majority of them due to malnutrition and disease. Etta Isles Dunord said, One thing that doesn't get talked about was more of a phenomenon or major problem than event, and that was how many people died in theater fires due to poor design, combustible materials, few fire exits, and panic. One of the worst was the Iroquois Theater in Chicago, 1903 which is both the deadliest theater fire and the deadliest single building fire in us history where patrons died after sparks from an arc light set a curtain on fire, then a chain reaction started, exacerbated by failures of the things in place that were supposed to combat fire. The theater had been overbooked to compensate for earlier power sales, causing some to sit blocking the exits. The fire was immediately worsened when performers opened the stage door to get outside, as it turned the fire into a fireball. Many people were held inside by iron gates that had been put in place to prevent people from sneaking in without paying. As people fled, they tumbled downstairs, trampled each other, and got squashed to death. Their unfamiliarity with the building got them stuck in dead ends and up against windows. Many jumped from fire escapes and died, while those behind them were saved, the bodies of the earlier jumpers cushioning their falls. All in all, 602 people died, many were children. The story is a lot more complicated and sordid with city corruption, etc. The one takeaway is the incident promoted the development and use of the panic bar. ADD, sorry this is so poorly written. I was trying to write it really fast on my phone. The Dingman said. I manage a school theater, and all of my students learn about this one. On thing I point out is that a lot of the same fire safety devices and procedures we have now existed then, but were defeated. Fire hatches in the roof should have prevented the back draft, but were nailed shut. The fire curtain was blocked, and built so poorly it wouldn't have helped anyway. If they're still interested, I cover the station nightclub fire as well. D00DSM00T said. The station club video is so haunting. There's so much much quiet and calm as a fairly stable camera man wanders about in records dying people stuck in doorways, burning and suffocating to death right in front of him. It's good for posterity I guess, but I can't imagine myself not putting down the fucking camera and not even trying to pull people from the building. I mean, they're right there. If I were the camera man, I'd be haunted by that forever. Pandora Mayviews said. Triangle shirt waste factor fire in 1911 is which your post reminds me of. Deadliest industrial fire at the time I believe 146 deaths in total and just an absolute cluster fug of neglect. Minam Spaghetti said. Working as an acting GM for a huge hotel, we had mandatory trainings on first aid, CPR, and crowd control. The Great White Station nightclub fire footage, some 20 minutes of uncut raw terror, was played for us by an FBI type trainer. It will forever haunt my dreams and sticks in my mind every time I'm in a crowded place. I will do lots of things to avoid bottlenecks, a crush of people, an indoor fire. Always check your exits. The Red Panda said. It is largest mass shooting in Asia since Shinman Square, with over 1,000 killed and even more wounded. The Uzbek government forcefully silenced reform protests by firing into the crowd and then kicked out 90% of Westerners in the country when the US Gov and UN tried to investigate. Terrible loss of life that rarely gets remembered because the Uzbek government tried so hard to cover it up. Oswin said. Taiping Heavenly Kingdom of Hong Xinquan. Put simply, it was an absurd kingdom in 1850s China that directly and indirectly led to the deaths of millions, maybe 10 million plus, of people through massacre and famine. 
Hong Zhuquan believed he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ and persuaded enough people to follow along and start a civil war. Check out God Chinese Sun by Jonathan Spence. Microfilmer said, The Taiping Rebellion is one of the most extraordinary events in human history that is virtually unheard of in the West. Perhaps as many as 70 million people died in the conflict. The tapings were truly revolutionary, as they demanded absolute equality between women and men. When they conquered a city they would give the inhabitants a choice to join them or die. Those that chose not to join were killed, all of them. The conflict lasted for 21 years 1850-1871, and may be the second deadliest war in human history. Literally no one knows about it. The Midnight Scorpion said. Galveston, Texas was once considered to be one of the most important commercial ports in the United States and was referred to by several fantastical names such as the Queen City of the Gulf and the Wall Street of the West. All that changed when it suffered a near-direct hit from a devastating Category 4 hurricane in 1900, the deadliest natural disaster in American history. Pretty much the entire city was destroyed by a storm surge and anywhere from 8,000 to 12,000 people died. Galveston was rebuilt but it never truly regained its status, Houston became the state's commercial center in the storm's wake, in addition to other factors. Dank Vectors said. There was also the Black Tom explosion in Jersey City, NJ just before the US entered World War I. Damage from the explosion is why you can't go to the torch on the Statue of Liberty today. German agents sabotaged the ammunition depot on an island in the harbor after the US passed an embargo on armed shipments to Germany. Fortunately, because it happened around 2 a.m., only four people were killed. Shanthi said. Thanks for mentioning the Halifax explosion. Here's the heritage minute for those of you who aren't Canadian. HTTPS colon slash slash dot be slash rw dash fbwmzpko. Hold up the train. Ammunition ship a fire in harbor making for Pier 6 and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. Vince Coleman, train dispatcher. Edit, apparently the Halifax explosion heritage minute is tied for Canada's favorite heritage minute. In 2012, the Historica Dominion Institute, now Historica Canada, commissioned a poll by Ipsos Reid of 3,900 Canadians to determine the most popular minutes. The top five were. 1. Jackie Robinson 2, tied for first. Halifax Explosion 3, Jenny Trout 4, Winnie and 5, Laura Secord, https colon, slash slash, www.thecanadianencyclopedia.ca, slash en, slash article, slash heritage dash minutes dash colon, tilde colon, text equals each percent 2060% 2d second percent 20 short percent 20 film comma television percent 2c percent 20 in percent 20 cinemas percent 20 in percent 20 online. Seriously, for those of you who aren't Canadian check him out. Visual KK said. My friend's mom survived the genocide by hiding in corpse piles during daytime to avoid patrols, and traveling only at night. That's as much as she'll share with anyone because of how traumatic it was. Another friend's dad was an AVRN ranger trained by the USS FRGR, and after escaping a POW camp at the end of the Vietnam War, himself and several other soldiers helped ferry Cambodian refugees into Thailand, while waging guerrilla warfare on the Khmer Rogue along the way. He said the killing fields was worse than anything he saw fighting in his home of Vietnam. I don't know if this was part of a larger organized effort or an isolated incident of a small band of soldiers who wanted to do something heroic. I can't verify if these things actually happened or the story simply hasn't been told yet, since I can't find any historic writings about it to back up his story. Kai Bishop said, When you thought somebody had to die because they were an intellectual but they actually just need their glasses to read the menu at McDonald's from more than 5 feet away without struggling. As someone who is legit blind I still cannot see why glasses are so associated with academia while other health aids are associated with medicine and disability. It's a weird distinction. Like, I don't wear my glasses because I'm scholarly, I wear them so people have faces and aren't just big head shaped blobs. Majinsby said. Everyone has a cell phone now, right? But they started off as expensive tools. My dad, a real estate agent, had a car phone. People who are skilled artisans or academics need glasses to continue their careers. But, that's about it. 
Bricklayers don't need glasses in the same way, neither do fishermen or farmers. Glasses were originally tools used by academics the intelligentsia to be able to continue to read and write into their old age. People reading and writing into their old age were very likely to be the intelligentsia. Sensual Octopus said, I visited the school converted to a prison in the killing fields when I went to Cambodia and it was horrifying. Besides the killing tree, the most heartbreaking thing was at the school they had pictures of all the people killed. There was one little boy who looked so terrified but you could tell he was trying to be so brave. It is astonishing how cruel people can be. Mon Petit Kerr said, There's so many that I would go with, that will probably be mentioned in other comments, but I think any stories about workers in the early 1900s are pretty horrible. Radium Girls is a pretty horrible event for example. After being told that the paint was harmless, the women in each facility ingested deadly amounts of radium after being instructed to point their brushes on their lips in order to give them a fine tip, some also painted their fingernails, face and teeth with the glowing substance. The women were instructed to point their brushes in this way because using rags or a water rinse caused them to use more time and material, as the rinse was made from powdered radium, gum arabic and water. Many women died and became sick with horrendous diseases. One woman named Molly Maggie hit her jawbone crumble. You can read about that here. Mon Petit Kerr said. By May, her dentist thought Molly needed surgery to remove a fast-growing abscess he'd found on her jaw. When he got the gums open, the bone didn't look right as it was too ashy and gray, so he gently prodded it with his finger. To his shock and horror, the whole bone crumbled under his fingertip like ashes in a fireplace. Instead of removing a tumor, he wound up digging Molly's entire left jaw out with nothing but his fingers. Unbeknownst to him, the radium had perforated the bone cells and stripped them of calcium. It had, like a little machine gun, shredded the collagen inside the bone and left it as little more than a pile of splinters. There's also a great book on this called The Radium Girls, The Dark Story of American's Shining Women by Kate Moore. This whole story is extremely depressing. Work in the 1800s and early 1900s was pretty horrible for a lot of women, men and children. Brew lunches, female miners in the 19th century, you can look that up, children in chimney sweeps etc. Ravenna Moore said, I've read the book, it's just horrifying. The worst part, for me, was during one of the trials. A doctor was testifying, reading the medical records of one patient, and came to the end where he said the prognosis was terminal. Suddenly someone started screaming. It was the woman whose medical records were being read. None of the doctors had told her she was dying, so that's how she found out. Ninja Parad with Ibe said. This whole story is just so, so sad. And the saddest part is that these women were literally fighting for compensation on their deathbeds and only if you received justice before they died. Talk about manipulating vulnerable people into doing your dirty work. There's a movie coming about about it soon with Joey King. Madison Rogue said, You think it's bad, but it's even worse. The Radium Dial Corporation had a factory in Ottawa, Illinois just off the Illinois River. The warehouse basement was a dirt floor, and that's where they stored all the paint. Paint that splattered and spilled all over the dirt floor, seeped into the ground, and not only contaminated the site, but probably the Illinois River. The river serves as Ottawa's water supply, and ultimately spills into the Mississippi River. The corporation was still in violation even into the 70s. There's an old documentary I watched in high school chemistry class about it. Ottawa is a neighboring town to my hometown. It's some pretty crazy shit. As Square Elks said, Oh it is not so many big corporations just carelessly pollute and get away with it. There's a region of Louisiana known as Cancer Alley because of the unusual number of cancer cases that occur there. It's a group of majority black counties that also has a disproportionate amount of oil refineries built there. Then there was Love Canal, a suburb that was built on top of ground that was so polluted it was essentially a sea of poison, and occasionally the toxic waste that was dumped there would bubble into people's basements or even up to the surface because it was just dirt dumped on top of a waste dump. Residents were not informed of the land's previous usage, and a bunch of children were born with physical deformities. They had to take EPA staff hostage to get the federal government to help them leave. Tiffon Storm said, I'm not really a proper historian but I feel the need to mention the Bronze Age collapse. It's not as though nobody talks about it at all but considering how catastrophic it was, it doesn't get nearly enough attention. 
At this time civilizations were still pretty scarce but the eastern Mediterranean was full of them. We can't pinpoint an exact reason but at some point it all fell apart. The Mycenaeans? Gone. The Hittites? Gone. The Minoans? Gone. The Egyptians? Barely clinging on and having serious problems. There are many things that happened around that time in the general area that could be the culprit. Volcanoes, earthquakes, drought, famine, war and invasions from foreigners that came by boat that historians have named the sea people because we have basically no idea where they came from. In reality, it was probably a combination of some or even all of them. Again, I'm not a proper historian by any means but this is what I heard. Actual historians, feel free to correct any mistakes or mention something I missed. Misera 101 said. In 535, humans went through hell. Many reported a strange color in the skies, not just in Europe. A dense, dry fog was also reported in Asia and the Middle East. Even the regions, now known as the Americas, weren't spared, for example drought in Peru. Temperatures were rather low in some places, it snowed either in the summertime. One survivor, a Roman politician named Cassiodorus, explained about the bluish sun and no shadows being cast, even in the noon. It has been hypothesized that Iceland holds the reason for the events between the years 535 and 536. Iceland is known for its volcanoes, and it was possible one such was to blame. Edit, thanks for the sliver. Literacy Eisbert said. Basically several natural disasters and social upheaval ob so fucking lootly devastated multiple societies. It's thought that a volcanic eruption blocked out enough sun to cause crop failures across Europe and as far as China. While this was happening terrible plagues were also afflicting the Middle East. Economies everywhere fell to ruin and stagnation in the years that followed because several other eruptions later made things worse. Daphne Dissert said. Leprosy Colonies of Hawaii. People who were diagnosed with leprosy were forcibly banished to Kalaupapa to live out the rest of their lives. They were dug graves, had to stand in them, while their families and friends basically had a living funeral for them where they had the dirt thrown on them. They were then pronounced dead to the world and no longer part of the community. This continued through 1969 even after Hawaii officially became a state. Edit, holy shit I did not expect my comment to blow up, thanks for all the awards and support guys, feel free to follow or message me, for either geeky epidemiology factoids or NSFW content. I love chatting and meeting new people. Dree Dreamer said. China had a similar practice, where they would send people with leprosy to leprosy villages. Even today, many of these leprosy villages live in extreme poverty, and people are afraid to interact with the children of these colonies, even though they are typically two generations removed from the infected. I got the chance to volunteer as an English teacher for two weeks for a program specifically devoted to helping these children get scholarships. I met a little girl who literally had to climb a mountain to get to school, and then had to take care of her little sister since her parents abandoned them to get jobs in the city. In spite of all that, she was also able to take care of a stray cat as well. Sorry that went off from a tangent, but it's definitely something I didn't know about until I went to China. V. Richardson said. The whole affair was really sad, and sometimes rules of engagement designed to de-escalate a conflict end up backfiring. UN peacekeeping forces were under very strict rules of engagement, in an effort to prevent any further bloodshed. However, that made it very difficult for the UN forces to involve to use any sort of force, even in self-defense. For example, if in a contested zone a UN unit came under fire, it was preferable to withdraw than to return fire. Some units realized this and used it force UN units to abandon the civilians they were trying to protect. They could then sweep in and dispose of the civilians at will. Peacekeeping units were also lightly armed and armored, in an effort to avoid provoking the involved parties. Enter Nordbat 2. They were a unit formed from Nordic countries, mainly Sweden and Denmark. From the onset, its commander, Colonel Ulf Henriksen, made it abundantly clear that he was not going to play around and sit while civilians were being killed. Running contrary to the prevailing thought of going in lightly armed to avoid provoking a response, Henriksen went the opposite route. His infantry were equipped with guided anti-tank missiles, and mounted on Finnish armored personnel carriers. Furthermore, he insistently requested, and was granted, a Danish tank company equipped with the newest Leopard 2 main battle tanks. When fired at, Nordbag 2 often shot back, 
frequently disregarding the UN rules of engagement. Colonel Henriksen made it clear that his interpretation of the mission objectives, which he had developed himself on the basis of the original UN mandate, rather than taking clues from his political superiors, was that protection of the civilian population was the highest priority. He made it clear that he would not respect rules and regulations that threatened to prevent him from achieving his mission objectives. When his own government tried to rein him in, he simply told his radio operator to pretend that the link was V. Richardson said, down until he had a fate accompli to present to Stockholm. In several incidents, Nordbag 2 personnel intervened to protect refugees and took action to prevent the cover-up of ethnic cleansing operations. On several occasions this took the form of forcing passage through roadblocks. During one such event, the battalion commander himself forced a sentry to remove the anti-tank mines used to block passage by threatening to blow the sentry's head off with the heavy machine gun. They even had a large-scale battle against Serb anti-tank positions that were trying to ambush the Danish tank battalion, which backfired in a spectacular sense, with the Danes repaying the intended mischief tenfold. This can be contrasted with the Dutch peacekeepers who were deployed in Srebrenica. The Dutch unit in Nordbagta operated under the same regional command, in the same general area. The Dutch peacekeepers, representing a professional elite airborne unit, were more or less helpless for more than a year inside the Srebrenica enclave because they were unwilling to initiate any confrontations with the parties to the conflict, and because they were willing to be micromanaged by their home government. Nordbagta, on the other hand, was something of a loose cannon and earned a reputation as a force to be reckoned with. It even became known as shoot but for its tendency to return fire, regardless of the formal rules of engagement. Nordbatt's willingness to bend or even break the rules, and disregard direct orders from both UN command and its own government, enabled it to achieve its mission objectives as defined by the 1st Battalion Commander, protect the civilians at all cost. Longer article here.